Welcome. We are so glad you are here. We are on week 13, which means we have three weeks left in this book and be thinking about what you might want to do next. Um, one of the things that popped in my mind was possibly doing the book of Isaiah. Um, haven't gone through that one in a long time. It is a rather long one, but there's always something relevant in Isaiah, I think. So that's something we can think about. And one of the best things about that is the idea that everyone can get their hands on a copy <laughs> at no additional cost to you, right? <laughs> um, so that's always something that we try to do now that we know better. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, open with prayer and then we'll get started. Dear gracious God, we are so thankful for this beautiful day outside. Um, heard the birds earlier today, a reminder of your love and care for us, the cooling breeze of the way that you care about our comfort as well. I ask that you be with us in our study tonight. Help us to have a new glimpse of you and how much you love us and care for us and want to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let me pull up what we have this week. And it's interesting because we're going to get a little bit of a repeat from last week. And then we're going to get quite a bit going into the next week. Or going into this week. So this one is something that we all love to do. Look at your own heart. 13. And this week I added so we can get a gauge of how many slides are in each section. Down at the bottom you'll see one of whatever. Um, don't be scared when the last section it says one of seven. Some of them are just one paragraph slides. Um, is there someone who'd like to start out reading for us today? Yeah, I can. Thanks, Karen. Um, it was common among the Jewish people to view religion as a list of things not to do. Don't walk any farther than a certain distance on the Sabbath day. Don't do anything that might make you unclean and unable to go to the temple. Don't associate with the wrong people or you may be condemned along with them, and much more. Too often we see the same attitude among believers today. If you ask an Adventist what they believe, you perhaps might hear, we don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't eat meat, we don't do anything fun on Saturday, or some such list of things we don't do. You hear far less about things that we do, things that make a difference in our families and communities. How different it would be to live as if God's love was an active thing, always reaching out to help others, always trying to make a difference. Christianity is not about hating others. It is about being kind to everyone. That morning by the lake, the people could see Roman pleasure boats being ready to sail. Too often the sounds of these revelers echoed across the water as the heathen Romans pursued their sensual pleasures. This offended the Jewish people because they felt pride in their morality. They felt that they were better than the heathen foreigners who lived only for pleasure. The Romans in particular had brought in their practice of lovers and wild parties. On the lake, in the streets, it seemed that everywhere the Jews looked, lust and sinfulness could be seen. The crowd looked to Jesus to condemn those heathen sinners and praised the superior Jewish morality. But as usual, Jesus pointed to the people's hearts. Just as the thoughts of hatred are as bad as murder, thoughts of lust and adultery in the heart are as bad as the act itself, he said. What you imagine in your own heart and mind, Jesus made clear, is what you would do if you had the chance to get away with it. This means that you are no better than those who actually live an immoral life. You may not be openly you may not be openly sinning, but it's only because you haven't had the opportunity. Once again, it was the heart that Jesus focused on. Here again, Jesus taught that what we need is not a stricter lifestyle or more rules to follow. What we need is a new heart, 
a heart like his. Through the prophet Ezekiel, God promised, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It's this new heart that we are in need of. There by the lake that morning, Jesus was trying to show them that it wasn't the strict rules of the Pharisees they needed, nor was it the loose Roman lifestyle that would make them genuinely happy. The kingdom of heaven he invited them to join didn't require a new oath of allegiance or a new passport. It required a new heart. He offers us the same invitation today. We don't need a new commitment to Sabbath keeping or to Bible study. We don't need more hours of community service or longer sessions of prayer on our knees. We need a new heart. And Jesus offers that gift to us today. So Jill, that, that one sentence was just for you. I've got my <laughs> So then this next section, does anyone have any comment on this before we go to the next section? As you read the first page, I was thinking of the Jews that crucified Jesus. They hurried home after their nasty deed so that they wouldn't break the Sabbath. They wanted to keep it holy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And that sentence at the end of page three, talking about you hadn't sinned just because you, you haven't had the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes... Uh, you hear maybe there's a movie idea and someone's like, okay, if you could do anything for one day and have no consequences, mm. what would you do? Uh, mm. And so think about that. Yeah. Is there something that we're not doing just because we don't want to deal with the consequences? Yeah. yeah. And then there's, not, then there's not doing it because it's wrong to do it. Right. Mm. Yeah. I would say heaven, here I come. <laughs> Why does it have, have to, to be play my enemy? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit. Um, and then we're going to go one step back and then two steps forward. And so we backtrack again to Matthew 25, 24. Um, and this is in the context of if you realize that you have offended someone in some way, um, and you're headed to give to sacrifice, leave your gift there on the altar, go and make peace with that person, and then come and offer your gift. This is not when someone's offended you, this is you realizing that you've offended someone else. And the author mentioned that this small section, there's only three slides in the section, is a repeat of the last reading from Thoughts of the Mount of Blessing, but this is in the easier language version, but it's kind of the same ideas because there's so many worthwhile thoughts here that it bears going through a second time and thinking more about it. And I think it goes very well into what um, this, this section is dealing with as well. Would someone like to read this section of slides? I'm happy to. Thank you, Jill. Yeah. God's love is not a list of things to avoid doing. God's love is positive and active, a living spring of water, always flowing to bless others. If that love lives in our hearts, we will do more than just not hate others. We will search, we will search for ways to show love and kindness to them. Jesus said, so when you offer your gift to God at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. Go and make peace with that person and then come and offer your gift. The offerings the Jews brought to God expressed their faith that through the Messiah they would receive mercy and love from God. But it would be a sham to express faith in a God of love and forgiveness while holding on to fear or hate someone or hate for someone. When someone who claims to follow God offends or hurts another person, he or she misrepresents misrepresents God to that person. This must be made right by confessing it as a sin. Even if the other person had done more to hurt us than we could have done to them, we are still responsible for our part. 
when we come to God in prayer or to give an offering, if we remember something we have said or done to hurt another person, we should go at once to confess and ask forgiveness. If we have done anything to cheat, trick, or financially injure someone, we should compensate him or her for the damage we have done. If we have misquoted someone or twisted his or her words to imply a different meaning, or injured someone's reputation in any way, we should go to the ones we spoke to and retract our damaging words. If disagreements between fellow believers were not made a public matter, but worked out between them in a spirit of Christian love, much evil and negative publicity could be prevented. If Jesus' followers were tied together by his love, the bitterness that afflicts so many could be erased. Amen. Before we dig into our questions, does anyone have anything they want to share? Boy, that, that cuts to the quick. Yeah. That's why there's so much silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pondering how many times I've done many of those things, and I, I need to just, oh, rewind. <laughs> oh. yeah and i think sometimes uh we feel the need to vent and depending on who we vent to it can be become more of um an evil or disparaging of someone else um we're just going to get off our chest how much we're frustrated with someone or how much we think they've done us wrong mm -hmm. um, i know that's something that i do and I try to just vent to my cat. It doesn't always work. Sometimes she hides. <laughs> and sometimes I need someone to agree with me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, depending on how it's done, that can be very destructive as well. And again, I speak from experience. Mm -hmm. All right, so our first question God's love is not a list of things to avoid doing. So then, what is God's love? And how does it mean we are supposed to relate to one another? If that's part of God's love. It's the golden rule. Which is? Remind Which us, is, Peter. Treat everyone the way you like to be treated. I mean, it's just love everyone. Forgive each other. Um, you know, we, we're, we're great debtors. We're all debtors because God has forgiven us. So how can we go and how can we go and not forgive others? And it really doesn't matter what it is, really. We're, we're compelled, constrained by Christ to forgive, even the worst of things. And it's so easy. No, it's not easy at all. <laughs> but if you don't it's going to it's going to ruin your health for one thing so mm -hmm. if, you, if you just be selfish for a moment for your health at least you know but but ultimately if we can't forgive others then god what is what does the lord's prayer says forgive us our sins as we forgive others who sin against us so it's pretty it's pretty basic but it's not easy to do no uh, from experience i've harbored a lot of resentment towards a certain person and I wasn't totally free until I spoke to that person and, and um, you know, had a conversation. So, and sometimes it wasn't anything so much that I did, but, but uh, I wasn't nice at one time. And, um, and sometimes you just, even if, as it said, you're, you're, maybe you hurt them less than they hurt you, but it's still always good to be quick to, to, to hash it out, ask forgiveness, because as the, lo the longer these things go, the hotter it is, the hotter it is mm. to come to some reconciliation. I saw a meme today, um, and some of it will be familiar to you. The first half said, you know, holding resentment and grudges um, is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And then the other half of it is, Note to self, poison the other person. Um, I don't think that's the what we're supposed to learn from it. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
but it it can be very damaging like peter said it can tear you up inside not just emotionally and spiritually but physically too holding all of that um trauma has huge um physiolog physical um consequences Mm -hmm. it's very draining emotionally and it saps you of energy that you could use for better things you know god's love also is you, can, you know it's always positive and always uplifting you know you like to be around people who are more positive or who can put a i don't want to say a spin on things but maybe that is the right word who who always look for the better as opposed to being around what I call negative Nellies all the time. They drain you. Talk about love and forgiveness. Uh, again, Christ, what a, what a forgiving spirit he had. He's mm. suffered more than any human being ever. And he says, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And chances are he also would have covered, Lord, forgive them. They know what they're doing. Yeah, that's true. True. Yeah. All right. So we'll go on to the next question. If it's a sham to claim faith in God while holding on to anger, and it says forgiveness, maybe it means unforgiveness or hate. I think that's a typo because um, it's okay to hold on to forgiveness. Um, how often are we trapped in a sham? And how do we let go of anger and then forgive? I think if we have to let go of anger, it's a God thing. And I think he allows us to, to look in the mirror and see who we actually are and how imperfect we are and how gracious he is. When we realize that and that he... For me, you know, you realize, you know, that he, he died for me. He's up there on the cross because of Jill. He's not because of my friend down the road and the nasty things they did or anything. He, he died up there for me. For me. That was really poignantly expressed, Jill. Um, it can't be that we for Our salvation can't depend upon our forgiveness, our ability to forgive, because then it becomes works, not grace. Mm. But following following salvation, that's a responsibility. I think. I thought, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that was all. <laughs> oh, my my thought in that second question is, um, why is it a sham to claim to claim faith in God while holding on to anger? Why is it a sham to claim faith in God while holding on to anything? There's only one thing that can solve it and that's God's love and his power no matter what the problem we have but anger is one that seems to be a problem I don't know. and we can make anger worse when we continually replay the situation that made us angry right or the instances when you replay that trauma you never have a chance to heal um, and it's like it's just happening over and over again um, so there are things that you can do to make life worse for yourself. Um, not saying that you can automatically turn it off and say, I'm not going to remember this anymore, but you can choose and we'll deal with this later on, choose which thoughts to give all your time and energy to. Right. Mm -hmm. And is it a process or is it a snap your fingers? I can let go of anger and forgive. <laughs> it's a process it's a journey yeah and you know and it might depend on what it is if my cat scratches me i'll be very angry and push her off my lap and i'm quick to forgive her um but if someone else were to like run into my car intentionally i might not be so easy on that right um, and every problem we have is different for every person right and the holy spirit and god knows the journey that we need yeah i think that's really important sometimes we like to judge people by our journey and say well i didn't have a problem with that why should you have a problem with it or that person doesn't bother me why do they bother you or you should be over that by now you've been a christian how long 
Um, but it doesn't always work that way, does it? Nope. No recipe. That's, that's a very good point when you're talking to people or whatever, you know, you, you shut people down is, is my phrase. I've said sometimes when you say some things or say that wasn't a problem. I've had, you know, relatives very, very sincere, you know, just you say something is a problem. They're like, well, I never had a problem with that. I had this, 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 this. And it's like, okay, I'm not talking about that with you anymore. You know, obviously <laughs> it's not your problem, but I mean, they just shut you down and give you nowhere to go. And it makes you, makes you feel inferior. And uh, we just need to recognize that when we're dealing with, when we're with other people too, who have problems that we necessarily don't have those challenges, but we need to recognize that they are very much so to that person. Yeah, as Sophia said, to pray for the person who hurts us um, makes us the bigger person, right? Mm -hmm. A lot more into it. Just, and I know, like, for me right now, I have a hard time um, showing the empathy that I need to for the extroverts who really need people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite there yet. I, people drain me. Um, so I'm probably or I'm not probably, I am, I am less empathetic than I should be with that. Um, and constantly need help remembering that not everyone's experience is my experience. Mm -hmm. Right. I had um, a situation where, um, I won't go into all the details, but it was a disagreement with one of the people I worked for. And I prayed about it and prayed about it. And do you know, every time the, for after that incident for about two or three or four days after when I was at work sitting at my desk, she never walked past my desk. She always went around the long way. And I was like, thank you, God, because I was just really angry. <laughs> uh -huh. but there's nothing wrong with trying to put ourselves in situations to make life a little bit easier either. Right. So uh, question number three, what would your church be like or your community or your family be like if all the bitterness in life that we have towards one another could be erased? It'd be a party. Yeah. It would just be a joy to be around, you know, it would just be uplifting. And that's, I mean, basically that's what heaven's going to be. Everything we're told, you know, we're going to get a, a fresh start and there'll be no sorrow, no tears. I mean, it's just going to be the ultimate joy that we, you know, we may get a glimpse of here once in a while when something come we come across that's just absolutely, you know, over the top with, but it's going to be even above and beyond that. At the epitome of a safe place. Mm. Right. All right. We will go on, and this is the next section is a little bit um, longer in the reading. So I'm warning you now. Um, and this is dealing with the verse. But I say unto you that whoever looketh on a woman with lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And again, this is not gender specific. That is not the point. Um, women lust too. You know, I've seen pictures of The Rock and Jason Momoa, uh, all those bodybuilders. Um, so the focus isn't so much about who's lusting after who. Um, and so we've got, like I said, this is a little bit bigger and we can break it up into sections if we need to, but some of the slides are just one big paragraph. This section comes from chapter three of Thoughts of the Mount of Blessing, um, pages 60 to 63. Would someone mm -hmm. like to start reading for us? I can read half. Okay. The Jews prided themselves on their morality and looked with horror upon the sensual practices of the, he of the heathen. The presence of the Roman officers whom the imperial rule had brought into Palestine was a continual offense to the people. For with these foreigners had come in a, a flood of heathen 
customs, laws, and dissipation. In Inferno, Roman officials with their gay par paramours haunted the parades and promenades, and often the sound of revelry broke upon the stillness of the lake as their pleasure boats glided over, their, over the quiet waters. The people expected to hear from Jesus a stern denunciation of his class, but what was their astonishment as they listened to the words that laid there that laid bare the evil of their own hearts. And before I want to go over, I just want to remind you this is um, 19, or this is 1800s language, and that meant the happy paramours. So it wasn't necessarily talking about homosexuality. So I just wanted to have that clarification there. All right. When the thought of evil is loved and cherished, however secretly said Jesus, it shows that sin still reigns in the heart. The soul is still in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He who finds pleasure in dwelling upon scenes of impurity, who indulges the evil thought, a lustful look may behold in the open sin. With its burden of shame and heartbreaking grief, the true nature of the evil which she has hidden in the chambers of the soul. The season of temptation under which it may be, one falls into grievous sin, does not create the evil that is revealed, but only develops or makes manifest that which was hidden and latent, and latent in the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. For out of the heart are issues of life, are the issues of life. Proverbs. If thy hand causes thee to stumble, cut it off and cast it from thee. If thy right hand cast, causes thee to stumble, cut it off and cast it from thee. To prevent disease from spreading to the body and destroying life, man would submit to part even with his right hand. Or should he be willing to surrender that which imperils the life of his of the soul? Through the gospel, souls that are degraded are, and enslaved by sin are to be redeemed to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. God's purpose is not to merely deliver from the suffering that is the inevitable, inevitable result of sin, but from itself. The soul, corrupted and deformed, is to be purified, transformed that it may be clothed in the beauty of the Lord our God, conformed to the image of his Son. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Psalm 19, 17, 90, 17, 829, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eternity alone can reveal the glorious destiny to which man restored to God's image may attain. In order for us to reach this high ideal, that which causes the soul to stumble must be sacrificed. It is through the will that sin retains its hold upon us. The surrender of the will is represented as plucking out the eye or cutting off the hand. Often it is for us to, that to surrender the will to God and sent to go through life maimed or crippled. But it is better, says Christ, for self to be maimed, wound, crippled, wound, crippled. If thus you may enter into life. That which you look upon as disaster is the door to highest benefit. God is the fountain of life and we can... We can have life only as, it, as we are in communion with him. Separated from God, existence, existence may be ours for a little time, but we do not possess life. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 1 Timothy 5, 6. Only through the surrender of our will to God is it possible for him to impart life to us. Only by receiving his life through self-surrender is it possible, said Jesus, to these hidden sins which I have pointed to be overcome. Is it possible that you may bury them in your hearts and from human eyes, but how will you stand in God's presence? Cling mm -hmm. to self, refusing to yield your will to God, you are choosing death. The sin, whatever found, God is a consuming fire. You choose to separate, and refuse to separate it from you separate from it. God, which consumes sin, must consume you. It will require a sacrifice to give yourself to God, but it is a sacrifice of the lower for the higher, the earthly for the spiritual, the perish the perishable for the eternal. Is not designed that our, our this is not designed that our will should be destroyed. For it is the only exercise that we can accomplish what he would have us what, what he would have us do. Our will is to hold it to him that we may receive it again, purified and in sympathy with the divine that he can pour through us the tides of his love and power. However bitter and and painful this surrender may be, may appear to the willful, wayward heart, yet it is profitable profitable for thee. Not until he fell crippled and helpless upon the breast of the covenant angel did Jacob know the victory of conquering faith and receiving the title of a prince with God. 
It was when he halted upon his thigh that the armed bands of Esau were stilled before him, and the pharaoh, proud, of, proud heir of kingly line, stooped to crave his blessing. So the captain of our salvation was made perfect through sufferings, and the children of faith out of weakness were made strong, and turned to the to flight the, the armies of the so do the So do the lame take the prey, and the weak become as David, and the house of David as the angel of the Lord. Thank you, CJ. Any comments before we head over to our questions? I love at the bottom of page six, that line, or the, the sixth one. Um, Our will is to be yielded to him that we may receive it again, purified and refined and so linked in sympathy with the divine that he can pour through us the tides of his love and power. That is so filled with hope. It's not about what we lose, but what we gain. Yeah. It says pour through us, not just trickle it down. You know, where it says, it says that Jesus said it'd be better to cut your arm off your right hand or pluck your eye out. Uh, some years ago, I was kind of new to the faith, but uh, one of the people that kind of, kind of nurtured me, she used to visit a man over at the Veterans Hospital over in Bedford. And uh, this man was blind because he took this literally. He plucked out his eyes because whatever he was looking at or whatever he knew was awful. But I mean, Jesus isn't asking us to do that, but he, he's just basically telling us that it's, it's just to give up things. It's kind of like the same thing. You know, we need to, we need to let go of things. We need to depend upon him to, to give us the victory over these things. But uh, I've never heard of anyone since a case like that, but yeah. Well, I know um, one of the early church fathers in the first century after Christ died, um, Origen, he made himself oh. a eunuch because he oh. couldn't deal with his own temptation. Oh, I see. Um, okay. Yeah, um, that's but I use that quote sometimes when people complain about what a woman wears to prevent people from having bad thoughts. I said, Jesus never talked about what a woman wears. He talks about plucking out your own eye and dealing with your own stuff. It's not my responsibility to make you not That's lust. That's wonderful, Christy. That's real good ammunition. <laughs> and I'm sure people consider me sassy for doing that. But <laughs> yes, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but you have you have freedom to do anything you want. Certainly can stop at your if it's going to offend your neighbor. Right, and you know, we have we have freedom. We it doesn't mean we always anything we can do we not necessarily should do. But if I know that. I know that taking my canoe out on Sabbath afternoon and getting a little uh, nature, God's other book, and, and just, just enjoying that time with my wife. But if I happen to know that that really irks someone, um, I would maybe choose not to do it. You know, or, I just. You know. Or drive far away to do it. Well, <laughs> so you, had then, you had to say that, didn't you? Yeah. Well, there's also instances where you're like, okay, that's really not. Except we need to re-educate. I had a, a visitor one time. I was wearing a dress at church and it came to my knee and they said, anything that shows your knee means you're biblically naked and I can't look at you. And I'm like, okay, that's not right. We need to have another conversation. That's not going to stop how I dress because that's very off base. Um, but sometimes there are things like, hey, you know, if I was to chow down on... Um, a pork loin right, you know, during potluck, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Not that it would anyway, because I'm a vegetarian, but there are things that it's okay to make concessions for. And other ones where you're like, okay, that's going too far. You have to wait till you get home, Christy. Yes. I wouldn't even know how to cook it or eat it. Just 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 bring just bring some salmon to a potluck sometime. Oh, I'm sure it'd be one of the first things to go. <laughs> There's a time and a place yeah, right. for most things. And we need to, we need to just yeah. recognize that. So if, if you're doing it to get a rise out of someone, shame on you. Exactly. 
Exactly. If your intentions are pure and everything, you know, it just then then dig in. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and so it goes back to, you know, he's talking about when you have these thoughts, it's not saying, hey, you have a thought come in your head and it goes out of your head right away. That's not necessarily what he's talking about because that's just life. He's talking about you sit down with those thoughts and you caress those thoughts and you like really dwell on them. Mm -hmm. And you make a point to entertain those thoughts rather than, wow, that was improper and toss it aside. That's different. And you know, there's an, I've been doing a lot of reading lately, kind of, I don't want to say it dwells on it, but it does bring out the point how, you know, when we go with those thoughts, how, how devious and how clever Satan is to continue to milk those thoughts and, not to aggrandize him, but all the power that he has that we do not see going on behind, you know, that, that is literally, there are angels on both sides, you know, that are fighting for us. And um, the more we can, you know, just fall on Jesus, you know, and just say, man, this is really tough, you know, the more that gives us all the power we need, but there are major, major things going on behind the scene that I think we won't even begin to understand or recognize till we're in heaven. Well, then let's jump into our first question. And this even goes more, I think, than just, you know, immoral thoughts and just thoughts in general, kind of where Jill was going. You know, how would we feel if Jesus said nothing about the immorality of Las Vegas or different areas, you know, Sin City, Mardi Gras, that sort of thing? but instead spoke against our own evil thoughts that no one hears. Is it fair for thoughts to be as bad as ideas? Why or why not? And why did Jesus choose to point out thoughts as evil? Well, thoughts lead to the other. If you don't have them, then the other won't right. necessarily yeah. follow. I mean, it's the same thing like, you know, well, I drink only a little. Well, that's fine. And maybe some people can drink only a little and stop. But, you know, most people that are in trouble have started out with a little of something, whether it's, right. I mean, alcohol is easy to pick on, but if it's, if it's something else, whether it's embezzling or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, or a little lie, and then it, it does keep compounding. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. When, 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 and when Eve took the fruit and ate it, when did the sin happen? When she actually bit into it and started chewing it? Or was it before? Yeah. Before. It was long before, right? Amen. Probably when she wandered away. And when Adam when Adam took it, he knew what happened. When did it happen? When he when he took and ate it too? No, it happened before that, you know. I think it's so that it, the, 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 it, it starts long before the act, um, you know. Have any of you ever gone on little rabbit trails with your thoughts where one thought leads to another, leads to another? Um, it can be the same way here. You may think something and then you're choosing to dwell on that and it makes you think of something else. Think some, so even not necessarily compounding deeds, which were actions, but it can also compound different thoughts that keep going that way that can then make it easier to go into different actions. Sure. You, I was going to say that something like that, but you say it so much better. But the other thing, too, is if you continue to think a thought that you shouldn't, and it becomes a habit, and then it just keeps hopping into your head more and more and more. So it's good to just nip it right in the bud. And I think, you know, uh, oh, go ahead, Peter. That, that question, how would we feel, Jesus said nothing about the immorality of Las Vegas. Well, when you read the Bible, where is God's greatest anger, not anger, I guess, but judgment? What was it upon? Was it upon the other countries so much? Or was it upon God's own people, his own church? The church. Jesus Day of the church, right? So, so you know, we're the, we, can't, we can't be focused on what happens in Las Vegas or what happens other places. We have to, we're the ones that know better. We're the ones that read our Bibles and, and, and get to know Christ. So, you know, we don't we really don't have time to be worrying about what other people are doing. You know, we need to we need to focus on our relationship. And, and of course, the next question about the will is just just key to all of this, really. 
we need to realize that we are part of those sick people. We are. We are. We are. And We're sinners, sinners saved by grace. That's what we are. I was listening to a sermon the other day, and after the sermon, some people, some saints, the word he used, came from the audience and gave me a really hard time about um, cheap grace. They used that word, cheap grace. Oh, you can't, yeah. you can't yeah. talk about cheap grace like that. And when they were done giving me a really hard time, he walked off the stage and there was a bad person hiding in the shadows. And uh, he brought the, to the bad person, told him about Christ and told him that, you know, he would accept him just the way he did. He didn't have to get cleaned up. And he says, it's so nice to talk to bad people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have yeah. to say, I'd rather talk to someone who knows they're not perfect. Um, I think also, I don't know about anyone else, but for me, when you do something repeatedly, or you think something and they laugh, it's very easy to rationalize um, why something might be okay if you've already started doing it. And so then you're lying to yourself or you're making excuses for yourself, and that can um, lead you even deeper away from where you want to be. And I think uh, if he talked about Las Vegas, then we would just compare ourselves to Las Vegas and think that we were really good. Yeah. We're not? <laughs> I understand Las Vegas has more churches than any other city. They at least have more wedding chapels, probably. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to get... Go ahead. Oh, and divorce setups too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. one-stop shopping. They have many, <laughs> right. houses, many houses of worship, casinos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So now we're going to go to that question that uh, Peter referenced. Um, how is the surrender of the will illustrated here by Jesus? What is our what is only possible if we surrender our will to God? I think, yeah, what, uh, what is only possible is, is peace. That's true. Exactly. Has anyone known someone who has had to have an amputation that ended up being life-saving or some sort of surgery that removed something like a gallbladder surgery or something um, that by taking something away, it actually gave life? <coughs> Excuse me. Somebody has a cold. Yeah. I had my appendix out and I felt much better after it was gone. <laughs> Are you okay? I'm okay. I just got a dry spot in my throat. <clears> throat> oh. Sophia? Yeah, for me, my dad, he was, uh, he had an accident when he was a nine-year-old. He was in the farm, so he wasn't an Adventist at the time. He was an Orthodox, so when he got amputated, he went to a different town from the village, and uh, the people who helped him were the Ad uh, Seventh-day Adventists, and ever since he became Seventh-day Adventist, he changed the whole family. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So is it easy to surrender our will? Surrender our will? I like, I think it's in um, Steps to Christ, where um, Ellen White talks about the need to constantly ask, God, make me want to want to give you my will. Mm -hmm. right? right? I am very stubborn. I like the things that I like. So if there's something I need to, you know, I like how I do things. So sometimes I have to ask to want to want to even do that, right? Well, I think about what Paul says in the New Testament. Um, I die daily. So he needed a new heart every single day. And guess what? So do we. Yeah. Well, and he also said, I relate to, you know, that. You, you get a new heart, but 
every day it's like that that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Exactly. That's what right. I do want to do. Right. I just right. can't seem to do. So, I mean, it's a yep. constant process, you know. I get, really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He also, he also, and I think it's Philippians says, the prayer is to ask the Lord to work out his will in us according to his good pleasure. Right. You know, and um, that should be a prayer every day, you know, work out your will, not my will, your will. Yeah, align my will with your will. Right. Yeah. And, and it's a struggle. Just ask any of the disciples. Just ask anyone you meet. Anyone, period, yeah. Really? So then, um, it is a sacrifice to surrender our will, especially in our society where individuality is praised and um, everyone talks about willpower, determination, and individualism. Um, but it is a sacrifice to give ourselves to God, to surrender that will. But what are we sacrificing in reality, and then what do we get in return for that sacrifice? In my case, at least, not much. I'm not sacrificing much, and I'm going to get a whole lot in return. Whole lot of what in return? Love. I'm looking for love and God's God's will in my heart. Um, when I when I listen to sermons, when I read in the Bible, when I read uh, Spirit of Prophecy, it. it I just enjoy it so much, you know, and that's, ask Jill, I talk about the Bible all the time while I'm at, <laughs> at the food bank, you know, it's just, it's really cool to talk about it. Well, it's just the more time you spend in something that gives you joy and it gives you peace, that gives you hope, it, it's easier to be drawn back to that. It's just, it is a process. That's what sanctification is, but it is a process. Right. It's only lifelong, Jill. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, there's some people who um, <clears throat> choose to believe and follow God because they don't want to receive eternal punishment. They'd rather be in heaven. And so they're looking about, they're looking for what they receive not why or anything like that and that can be an easy trap to fall into sometimes right i'm doing this because i don't want to suffer the consequences of not doing it and sometimes that's a great way to start the process and get your jump start but you can't stay there yeah. there's a sort of you've got to continue your journey if you always stay on start you're never going to get any stronger right <laughs> If that's what the disciples had in mind when after the translation, there was no staying power in that. Like you say, they wouldn't have lasted. Because it's, think of the word sacrificed. When you think of the word sacrifice, does that mean that that's something that's going to be easy? <laughs> no. Right. So that already assumes it's something difficult. And we may be asked at a different point in our life to sacrifice different things for God. We may be asked to sacrifice some of our time with our families. We may be asked to sacrifice income or a career or where we want to live. But if we are receiving the peace of knowing that we're walking in God's will and his encouragement, that can go a long way to help us want to continue to sacrifice because it's a choice to sacrifice right yeah and i think the disciples when they sacrificed their livelihood was just to follow him they just wanted to be with him in his presence and i think that's what eternity is all about is being with jesus spending time with him yeah when we think about Jesus and what he did, it says that he sought not uh, to sit on God's throne throne so much as he saw our great need. Mm. So sacrifice to him wasn't really sacrifice. He was just acting on how he loves us, how God loves us. And he, he didn't despise the shame that he received. 
he didn't like going, oh, I got to do this for these people. No, he just, he not welcomed it, but he endured it. You know, he endured the shame that was, was ours upon himself. And there's no one ever since or before has ever done that. Yeah. And you know? there are things that Jesus gave up for good. Yes. Um, it's yes. not just, oh, I get resurrected, everything's back to what it was. And that was just kind of like a nightmare period of my existence, right? Right. right. There are certain things that are eternally sacrificed. Amazing, amazing, amazing. It says he's our intercessor forever. Yep. Not that, not that there'll be sin in heaven, but what, what he did for us, he's forever going to retain his human nature in the sense that he's going to look like us. I don't, I guess we're all, we'll know each other in heaven, but you know what I'm saying? That he's, he's forever. I mean, the other, the other, the other creations could be jealous, but you know what? They're not going to be. No. <laughs> He, he created us in his own image so we are right. going to look like right him. well that's right but i mean but what he's done for this planet oh, yeah. i don't know i mean well what i think is the other planets they know he would have done the same thing for them too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and so it's a constant reminder of what had to be done because God loved us so much. Mm -hmm. So God decided it was something that had to be done. Because God could have said, nope, you, you yeah. fell into this mess, you're dealing with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, tough love, sorry. But that's not what God did. God decided we were worth it. That's, yeah. No matter how low we feel, God decided we are worth it. Individually and collectively. I don't know about you, but that's kind of powerful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very yeah. humbling. Very, mm -hmm. just very, very humbling. It's just like, wow. So, any final thoughts on this section that we've dealt with today? All right. Um, next week is something that I don't have too much experience with. Um, marriage and truth next week. Um, chapter 14, our second to last chapter. Um, as a reminder, be thinking about what you would like us to do um, starting in three weeks. One thing that I had floated was the book of Isaiah, something everyone has um, access to a Bible. Um, translation isn't necessarily, which one you're using isn't necessarily a deal breaker. We can work with all of them. Um, so that's something to think of. And I'm going to stop the recording so we can have our prayer requests. <laughs>